kind of secluded. Welcome to the third school board budget workshop for 2012. Um, today on our agenda we have staffing, um, in other words salaries, and we have three year plan, and then we have another category. Uh, and if we have time we'll, we'll use that and get back to any issues that board members would like to spend some more time on. Um, Ken, would you like to uh, give us a brief overview of the staffing? Sure. Um, that's the largest part of your budget, so it's the part of the budget that I want you to be most comfortable with. You know, it's like 80% of the uh, $21 million. Um, that's where it is. So this year we're anticipating um, one and a half fewer total positions than we have right now because of some enrollment uh, decliment at Pond Cove. We can reduce one and a half teachers. The middle school and the high school are status quo as far as staffing goes, and we're not expecting <clears throat> any increases or decreases in our support staff. Um, the only unknown in that area is for special education. Um, we never know when we might have a need for a, an additional check or two. But the best way of doing that is just projecting current needs, and that's what we're doing. So that's sort of a two minute summary of where we are with staffing, but I'll be glad to. Uh, the other thing I should mention is that, you know, that line, you've heard me say this before, but that salary line um, would be much higher if it were not for the tentative agreement that we have with our teachers' association. Um, it's usually about two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars more in a conventional year, but we've reached the tentative agreement <coughs> Uh, with that teachers association which calls for a very very modest salary increase this year so thank you glad to answer any questions you have about staffing so do board members have questions about the staffing budget i have a question just um maybe just one of the schools could just walk us through uh how staffing is determined in terms of what's the, the rationale and thought process, you know, targeted class size, just so the public can have a better understanding of um, how staffing is uh, determined or projected for a, for a particular school. Yeah, with, with most of the staffing needs, Michael, it's based upon enrollment projections. Um, you know, whatever those projections are indicating, uh, determines the number of teachers we have. You know the class size limitations that we have, and if we're reaching a point where we're going to be exceeding uh, class size limitations, then we would recommend additional staffing. Uh, and the opposite is true this year. You know, we've got an enrollment decline, so we can cut back on one and a half positions at Pond Cove. The other thing that I think drives um, school budgets and adds to that um, that perception that you know the enrollment has been declining but the staff is at the same levels. Well often if you're waiting to add a position you know you do that when you have room in the budget to do it. Um, you know if you, for example if you wanted to add a, a literacy lead teacher at one of your schools and your enrollment declined um, it would be a good opportunity you know, to add that position you've been waiting for. The other thing that adds to that perception, a uh, perception that um, you're adding staff and the enrollment's going down. I heard that a lot, especially when I met with town councilors. Um, that was a prevailing theme. Uh, but it's special education. Um, that's just um, causing not only Cape Elizabeth, but schools throughout the country to add ed techs and special education teachers. Um, there just seems to be a growing 
population of kids with severe learning challenges populated <coughs> our schools. And these kids require the type of individual educational plan that sometimes requires a, an ed tech for the full day. So um, it's just not a Cape Elizabeth. Um, we thought we were the only school system in Yarmouth that was experiencing that. But when you start looking at school system in Cumberland County, everybody's experiencing that that uh, same trend. So, though the enrollment has been going down, uh, those needs have been going up. I, I just like to add a couple of points to that because I've heard this every year. Uh, first of all, uh, you can have a decline in enrollment, but that doesn't translate into necessarily being able to cut a teacher or an ed tech. You, the enrollment spread out over 12 grades. If you lose six students and that's spread over 12 grades, you can't exactly, whatever percentage that is, cut that percentage of teachers because you'd be cutting off arms and legs of teachers rather than whole teachers. It has to drop to a certain level in a certain class before you're able to then combine it and then not go over the state mandated limits. The other thing is that, especially in a high school, to be the kind of school we want to be, we, we really want classes at the high end, like AP calculus or a, certain AP classes. And we also, as a public institution, want to have the, I don't know what it's called yet, but like high school diploma level. Those classes tend to be smaller, but you have to have them in a public school. First, so we can be one of the best schools in the state, and the latter because we have to serve, and rightfully so, every one of our students. So, that's it. Anyone else? Um, I just have a really quick question. And are we on to this, the, the area where you, um, can you mention the Alcohol Parents Association leaders? Uh, um, so, half the tutorial services. Fifty dollars per day. Is that fifty dollars per tutor a day? Is that? General? That's what we're currently paying the tutor that's providing those services at Monco. Okay. And what is what's half day? Four hours. That's in a that's a rate that she agreed to with the Monco Parents Association. Okay. So it's a it's a rate that we couldn't. Um, our our ed techs are making more money than that. Uh -huh. and, uh, and of course, our teachers are making more money for that, so we can't run that program as efficiently as it's currently being run. We do have to find a solution to it because um, the Parents Association um, isn't interested in picking up that funding any longer. So, don't have a precise answer for you today about how we're going to do that. We do recognize that those kids need services, and we're going to have to figure out a way of providing those services. I mean, the other thing that I mentioned in my email to you is that um, even between now and the, and the end of the year, we're going to experience some un unanticipated changes. Uh, it usually happens every school year. Someone will decide at the last moment to retire, let us know, um, or someone will get a job someplace else, or someone will have to move. And when that happens, you know, it's like, it causes you to rethink how you're running that program, so you may decide to move something here that's not there, and it allows you to cover something like this. So, I mean, those are the kinds of things that I'm sure are going to happen between now and, uh, and June that will enable, you know, things to become rearranged. But the point I want to assure you is that those students who have uh, needs in mathematics in grades three and four, we're just not going to pretend like they suddenly don't exist. I mean, that's not a solution. We need to find a way to, of, of providing similar services. Okay. Can you expand on that a little bit as to why it is we, are, we have students in grades three and four that need tutoring? Is there um, an issue with our program that these folks, kids are falling through the cracks or is it can you expand a little bit? Sure. It's, it's just a desire to make sure that kids who aren't meeting the standards or they're not where we think they should be in mathematics are getting the kind of extra services they need. Um, I'm sure they've existed every year for the past hundred years, um, but I think schools in general are becoming much more savvy 
about how to provide kids with the individual support that they need in order to experience success. I mean, if you look behind the Achievement Center, which I think is the, sort of like the poster boy for that concept, I mean, it's just a tremendous asset to Cape Elizabeth High School. You know, kids from all different kinds of levels are able to access the Achievement Center and get the kind of support they need to probably reach to places that uh, years ago, without that sort of service, they didn't. So it's the same kind of thing with the math program. I think we're servicing right now 15 kids at each grade level. Total. Grade three. three yeah. It's just not very many. Right. Thank you. Okay. Can um, and those students are known about, and they're um, the programs known about and given to the math team, the math leads. Um, I think you are math given to the math leads, and then they are looking at that need in the math department to, to make, um, to take care of that. Right. So it's not something we're throwing out without um, a plan, but we're, it's actually, it has been in the works for a while through um, the teaching and learning workshop and then work. Yeah, it's the same approach with literacy that we have, and we have the same sort of support for kids who are struggling. Um, with reading and writing issues. So, in fact, if I could just follow up with one more. So, um, you've said that, the, that, that these kids with needs exist, and that the needs will be met. And because you haven't put um, specific, any specific request around the, this need in the budget, I, what I am taking away is that you believe the budget, the, the resources exist in the budget to address the need. But you said you're not exactly sure what the strategy will be yet, but that you don't think that there need be any additional resources in the budget in order to address that need. Right, right. I mean, if you, I mean, if you needed a solution today, it would have to be a half-time ed tech um, for fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. But I'm not, you know, I'm not certain that that needs to be the plan we land on. You know, I think there's some other things that. If uh, we have another month or two to figure out, um, might be even better than an ed tech. But you know, <clears throat> that would be the plan as of this minute. But I, don't, I really don't think we need that. Okay. Ken, just to make sure, is the tutorial services that are being provided by uh, Pond Cove Parents Association, is that, are those tutor tutorial services related to math or are those two separate? Are they the same issue? Is that what the Parents Association is providing is just mathematics support for the kids in grades three and four. And then just one follow-up. I know on, um, we have class size targets. David gave a great example. If you lose one student per grade, it doesn't mean you can reduce that position. But in some areas that are more volume related, if you're serving less lunches, <coughs> You know, I assume you're driving. You know, are there areas we should expect if you know the enrollment continues to decline that there's a higher correlation between staffing and um, you know the number of students? I mean, I was just you know, like food services. If you're serving less number of students, you know, are there areas we could anticipate um, you know savings there if, if we continue to see enrollment declines? Yeah, but they probably won't be noticeable. You know, it's. It's not the type of enrollment decline that's going to cause you to, you know, take a bus off the road, for example, uh, or you're going to be serving such fewer lunches that you can reduce one of the school nutrition workers. It's not that sort of decline. So it's it's kind of like um, you've been flying the plane with all the seats full, uh, but you still got to fly the plane with a few empty seats. So the costs are going to be pretty similar. Where the savings will come is with, uh, you know, reduction in staff. That's, you know, you're getting sick of me saying that, I know, but that's, that is where all the money is. So this year, for example, with one and a half fewer teachers, you know, there's a su substantial savings in the salary line. Any other questions? I just had one more. Uh, Dominic's not here, but just 
I know he mentioned uh, contracted services. Um, you know, that's not a salary line item, but it's in lieu of a salary position. And I just would suggest at some point, if, I think you mentioned we might have a contracted services. Someone comes like for two days. I just don't know if there's an opportunity if Falmouth or Yarmouth had one day, if you could actually hire someone to serve both schools. You know, you have the same person. Those children probably have similar needs each year. And you may actually be able to, you know, provide a better service and actually save dollars. I know this isn't, you know, Dominic's not here, but I just think that may be an area we could pursue. Mm -hmm. Even though you'd be adding staff, you know, when remote comes down, but you're actually saving dollars versus contracting out the the uh, the program. Yep, that's a, that's a good idea. I mean, contracted services do save you a lot a, a lot of money with examples like that. You know, you're not paying the benefits, for example, and usually those people are, you know, in two or three different school systems, and there's some added value to that. You know, they're able to bring some solutions from other places that we might not have considered. David? Just to follow up, I'm not sure if I had, uh, which question you were asking. You're asking that if we share a contracted person, we'll save money, or you, I might have said it's our contracted people we pay per hour. So if we're sharing with somebody, it's not going to give us a savings, because we're only paying them per hour anyways. Um, or are you saying we should shift from salary positions to contracted positions? Uh, I'm just saying we should look at all the options and determine what's the best solution for the school system. I don't know the answer, I'm just saying, I'll, okay. you know, you may be a person there, a CAPE employer uh, for half the year, or 40%, they're Yarmouth for 60%, and, you know, you, may, you actually might have greater continuity, and even though you might pay benefits, you, it's cheaper than contracting out the problem. I don't know the answers, I'm just saying, you know, that's a, something we could look at at some point. And I'm sure we have, but just... As a new school board member, just wanted to see what what we're doing. Other staffing questions? Okay. Um, so then we'll move to the three-year plan. Do you want to give us a quick? Introduction to that, Ken? Yes, I do. I, um, you know, three-year plans when it comes to school budgets are really crystal balling it, and there's nothing precise in my crystal ball. Um, but for the benefit of the public, uh, what the school committee, school board is considering is not only this year, but also the next two years, particularly when it comes to revenue, uh, because that's part of the story of this budget and it will be part of the story of next year's budget. That federal stimulus money is going away and so the school board needs to be very um, intentional about how it uses revenue not only this year but next year and the year after so that you don't put all of your eggs in one basket produce, you know, a really low tax rate one year only to, you know, ask residents to swallow up a seven or eight, ten percent increase in taxes. So the plan we've provided tries to even, you know, the impact on taxes, maintain what we presently have so that we get through um, the present dismal economic climate in hopes that there will be a recovery sometime so, uh, or at least within the next three years, not so. So that's, um, that's sort of the big picture. Um, getting into some of the details, there's $500,000 that's that we presently um, have squirreled away. Uh, it was very smart of the school board last year to do that. Um, so that money's going to go away. And so what we're, we're suggesting is that the Medicare money you have, um, use that to make up for the loss of the federal uh, stimulus money next year. 
you could use all of that Medicare money or a big portion of it this year and, you know, really get the impact on property taxes down even lower than what it is, but then you'd be setting up a real problem in year two. I don't know if you follow all of that or not, but if you look at that Medicare line, you can see we're, we're recommending not using any of it this year and putting $180,000 into year two. Yeah, just to clarify, when, when Ken means this year, to the layperson, he actually means the next fiscal year, not this year. And um, what you really mean is Medicaid, not Medicare, if I understand I'm sorry. correctly. Yes, yes, yes. And next, next year, or next fiscal year, we're actually using jobs funds bills to make up a large part of the shortfall in this year, two and three, that we're really using uh, our ability, uh, 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 some great collection of Medicaid money that we scrolled away, plus some very aggressive collection of Medicaid money in those two years. Yes. Okay. Thanks, thanks for clarifying that. I've got an extra copy if you didn't bring it. Anyone need a copy? Of the three year plan? Yeah. Anybody else? Good. I've got a short one too. Thanks. Thank you. Kim, just because I think one thing that will jump out to people is uh, total expenditures for the upcoming fiscal year are really 450000 and then for the 2012-2013, that increases to 760000 Ask me that again, Michael. The, the change in ex uh, the expenditures? Yes. The change this year is 447719 and we estimated, you know, 760 to 770 the next two years? Yes. Is the biggest change in that the, this year we had the contingency fee? What would be the? Uh, it, it, in years two and three, it assumes a two percent increase in salaries, whereas this year we've got a pretty skinny increase okay. in salaries. That's the biggest difference. Yeah, big, okay. It also assumes that we're going to keep spending the levels at current at current levels. So, like in your textbook account, it assumes zero percent, or in paper. It, Assumes zero percent. What it assumes is a very similar budget as what you have this year. You know, just two two years of maintenance budgets. And you can do that in many areas, but you know, like with price of oil and, and things like that, you, you can't do that. So we've built in probably a hundred thousand dollars each year, or eighty thousand dollars a year too, and a hundred thousand for that sort of thing. So it's. It's a fairly realistic look at the next two years, as much as you can be accurate at this point. Yeah. Um, I, Ken, I think, has answered it. I, I had a general question so I was going to ask of Pauline as to, she's increased our projected expenditure budget each year by a certain amount. It was 440000 for next year, 760000 for the year after, and about 770000 for the year after that. The major portion, I understand you're saying, is salary and benefits that we're anticipating going up, which is always true. Mm -hmm. And you also, I also want to know that even though that's 70 to 80% of our budget, did you plug in other increases, because prices always go up, and what were those increases? Just so the public and I can know that we're being prudent about um, or realistic, I guess is a better word, about our expenditure increases. Right. Um, over and above the salary increase, I looked at about $85,000 per year added to the salary increase. And what would that compose? Would that be like an increase in inflationary costs for supplies? I mean, how did you come up with that number? Well, I think it's what Ken said. We look at uh, an increase in oil, electricity, or other contracts that automatically increase every year. Do we also include just normal increases in costs of supplies and other other materials that we use because of uh, um, just normal inflation? I mean, I think, I think what we're, we're recommending is that you have two more years of a budget like the one you're presently considering. I don't think there's a lot of room 
um, in school budgets when you know you're losing this much revenue for a lot of increases. So if you get through two years of maintenance budget, then you, I think you'll be back on a pretty normal sort of budget cycle after the 2013-2014 year. But there's not room to fund um, a lot of major improvements and still keep that tax rate down. Um, so I think we're going to have to remain very conservative. I know you've been very conservative the past three or four years, but I don't see it getting better until the 2013-2014 school, school year. Well, that's helpful. I guess that was the point I was getting at, that really the increase is factored in contractual changes and, quite frankly, inflation. We're not adding programs, we're not adding things. It's just, but I also want to make sure it's enough. So basically what, you're, what we're saying is we're going to stay the same, but we have to build in some numbers for increased, normal increases that happen every year, uh, electricity, oil, cost of supplies, and so forth. But there's no material change other than for lack of a better word, I'll call it inflation or contraction changes. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Other questions on the three-year plan? It's just directional, I guess, longer-term Medicaid for, you know, planning beyond three years. You mentioned it's the, we, we the day, you know, that'll be tightened dramatically. Is that, you know, doing the visibility that may one day be a zero revenue? Contributor, or is it too far out to tell? I, I, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're thinking $125,000 a year is going to be the norm. Um, I, I think that might even get tighter than that. This is my personal. No science behind that either. But we were getting, you know, quite a bit of reimbursement for things, and they have. That is what has been tightened up dramatically. We would not be sitting on $480,000 under the present reimbursable schemes. David? Could I follow up a bit on that? Because I, I, a little knowledge is dangerous, but um, I have a little bit of knowledge about Medicaid. Um, my understanding that we would get reimbursed for Medicaid is different than hospitals. And other things, they, they front end the costs, Medicaid front ends the costs, and then they supposedly do a reconciliation a year or two down the road. We actually don't, and I wish Don was here, but my understanding is that we bill and get paid, they review the bill and then we get paid based on a bill. So it's each year, each month or each quarter, they're reviewing our bills and pay, paying us based on bills, not like hospitals where they simply project what your costs are going to be and pay you based on their estimate. Is that correct? Yes. So the reality, when we estimate 125, which is above what we think we get this year, we, it's a fairly safe number because it's based on actual billing and they're actually approving the bill as opposed to what's done with healthcare providers and other areas like doctors and hospitals. They're not just estimating from two years ago, they're actually looking at the bill and then paying us. Yes. And we're assuming that, uh, um, my also my understanding is the 125 we're assuming, we're doing a pretty good job, to Dom's credit, we're getting a very large percentage of Medicaid monies given out to schools in this state. I think we're getting like 80 to 90 percent of what they give to schools. Is that correct? I'm not sure of that. Okay. I thought you'd said that earlier, but... Um, and I appreciate that. I think people should understand that I think this is, I personally think this is a reasonable estimate based, and it's based on this year, this year being literally this fiscal year, is what we think we're going to collect. It may tighten, uh, it may very well tighten, but it's uh, a reasonable projection, and to be perfectly frank, it's not, that, it's a big item, but it's not that big an item in the $22 million budget that if we're off of it, it's going to have a huge impact in future years. Is that correct? Yes. Um the other thing is that this money is two years old, and uh, is it two years old, Paulina? One right now. Two years. It's two years right now, so you wouldn't be you, you wouldn't be using it until it was three years old. So it seems like if it was going to be subject to any change, we would certainly know by then. 
but we are actually in years two and three using them a bit earlier than waiting two years. Isn't that correct? I think it will no, still year, be two years. Year two, the 480,000 will be three years old. Right, but year, fiscal year, year three, three. That will be more recent. It will be, be a year old. A year and two years old. Right, and, but the protection in that is what I discussed earlier. They actually review our bills as we send them in, and we are actually providing the services, so there's usually two years safe harbor, but we don't really, quite frankly, that's not a, a real risk to wait for a full two years because they're actually reading, reviewing the bills as we send them in. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, parking fees. Let's talk about the importance of parking fees versus the work out of administration. What's your, my um, hope when we talked about it last year was that having parking fees would be another um, almost mandate for people, students to know that people are in the parking lot um, throughout the day on an unexpected, um, which would be good for the social emotional needs of teenagers. Okay, okay can I just interrupt yes. and, and see whether we have other issues related to the three-year plan and then, oh, sure. and then yep. get to that. We may be done, but I just want to make sure we're done with that. Yep. Okay. Actually, did not have a question. Okay. Um, and then we'll and get back to that. No, that's fine. Okay. It'll be Thanks. really quick. Just, um, can you, you're averaging out $125,000 prediction for the Medicaid, but the, the issue of uh, increased enrollment of kids with, you know, special needs and learning, how is that um, is that going to cover them enough? I mean, is it? Is, are we going to hope that this is is the average amount that's going to be a, a good, you know, safety net for these these children, or um, or do you will you potentially get more because we've got more of a higher population coming in? Yeah, they're really two different things. Um, we need to provide the services to that population right. described, regardless of whether any of those services are reimbursable. So even if Medicaid didn't reimburse us, we would still have to provide the service. So yeah. the kids will get the service, and the fact that we might get reimbursed for some of this is sort of gravy, if you will. OK, so that Medicaid is not really contingent on any kind of number. It, it, it just it's, here it is. What it is what you're going to get this this year? Right. And we take a look at our expenses right. and see if any of our expenses qualify for reimbursement. Right. Um, I'm sorry, David. I have a revenue question on the three-year plan, but also to further address your question, if we actually have an increase in services that we can charge to Medicaid, we can get reimbursed for that. The question is, it still has to fit into a tightening um, requirements of, of what they're going to reimburse. And it's fairly complicated. We, right. In the past, we're reimbursed on a bundled basis, which is where you get more money. Now it's separated out, and it's hard. But if we have somebody who comes in that we that Don can qualify as Medicaid, and the rules are, are whatever they are, we could get more than 125. So it is somewhat dependent on the type of students we have and what we can send out. but. It's not going to be much money. I think this is a fairly conservative money out of some. Um, my question is on the um, revenue we're, we're allocating from the state. In our three-year plan, we're assuming the same amount. Um, uh, I, I, I guess I'm wrong. Uh, our revenue from the state was 1.953 this year. I thought it was. I thought we kept it the same. This. This year it was 1.9. Next year it's going to be 2.2 if the budget the legislature is considering space. Okay, so that's what they've told us they'll give us for next year. Yes. And we plug the, that same number without any increase for the next following second and third fiscal year coming up. Right. Now, the questions I have or the points I want to make is that assumes that there aren't change in the legislature in terms of how they're going to allocate the money. Is that correct? Correct. And there is some movement in the legislature. They may go to a more income base as opposed to property base, which would naturally hurt CAPE. Is that correct? They would. They would. 
Um, and you have, but we've managed to get increases the last couple of years, which is nice and quite frankly surprising given our history. So you've simply taken that and sort of balanced the chances that there'll be your crystal ball and my crystal ball, that something's going to change the legislature. You sort of balance that and by keeping that number flat, there's probably a good balance between them maybe changing it and maybe ours going up again. Is that correct? Yes. We're just running with a number that we know. You know, if that was $300,000 less, we'd be running with that number, or if it was $300,000 for this exercise. You know, I think you're going to be giggling at this plan next year when you look at it. I mean, don't get the idea that this is precise science. Uh, just want to won't be crying. Right? I know. Yes. No, giggling would be a good thing. Right? I say, that is the <laughs> so, um, I think it's, what we're just trying to make sure is that you you wouldn't use that, that Medicaid money this year and um, put all your eggs in one basket kind of approach. I would like to clarify, even though Kim was being funny, I look at these numbers as, I do three-year projections all the time, and quite frankly, when you get to years two and three, it's, it's guesstimates. But I find these to be reasonable, conservative, such that we're keeping our taxes as low as possible, but not so unrealistically low that we're going to get caught with a real shortfall. But on the other hand, um, who knows what the state of Maine will do? Who knows what the state legislature will do? And that's a big ticket item. Um, this is, I think, a reasonable, prudent projection. Um, but you, that it is a projection. And people should be aware that a year from now, we could have been wrong. And we may have to ask for a higher tax increase than we anticipated. Or we may, I doubt this, that all of a sudden the state's going to give us more money than we're expecting. But it'd be nice. But these are just projections. And I think they're based on reasonable assumptions. That's all. Thank you. Are there other questions on the three-year plan? I just want to thank, thank you, Ken, for putting it together, and, and Pauline as well. I'm sure you, you, your fingerprints are all over it. it, it for me, it's very helpful to see um, you know how the numbers may may shape, be shaping up over time, um, particularly in terms of planning. Um, you know how the, how that planning affects this year's budget. So um, I understand that uh, all these numbers are subject to change, but it's it's uh, it's very helpful to be able to see what uh, we might be looking at two and three years down the road. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and so at this point. Um, I think we have time to turn to any um, open issues that have come out of these um, budget conversations uh, that we may want to circle back to. And, and um, I guess we'll I'll let you start, Kate, with, with the parking fee. Well, I guess, um, that, sorry to. No, that's all right. I saw a parking fee, and I just imagined if we took the 8,000 out, out in the three year plan. Um, how would we be doing if we took the 8,000 out? From the work in the past, I'm, the reason why the parking fees are in here, I know we voted on it last year for a reason. Um, and the reason was that we needed all the revenue that we could get. And so that instead of cutting teachers, we put in the parking mm -hmm. fee. So this year, I'd love to ask Ken what you are. Um, I, I, know, I understand we still have a need, there's still a need for revenue, um, but as we've done a year of experience with Jeff and Troy going through the high school, um, is that worth? Well, I, I was worried about that, that, as you know, you're yeah. concerned about you know high school administrators having to be parking meter maids. Um, but in asking Jeff, it's not as much uh, labor intensive work as I anticipated. So I'll let Jeff and Troy answer. Your yeah, I mean, I, I mean. I, I think we've been able to administer it, honestly, more efficiently than I expected or feared. But what I don't want to do is have any illusion that parking fees are, because we have parking fees, therefore we are going to be having any sort of constant, regular administrative supervision of the parking areas. Because in my view, that would be a waste of time. Um, what we've done um, is 
we have a series of warnings actually for the first couple of weeks I was in the junior parking lot in the mornings as kids were coming in to try to in a very friendly way let them know that the fees had been increased and, and why and to have a conversation and then after that we had several levels of warnings that we did um, culminating ultimately in just letters going home to a very tiny number of parents because everybody else had caught up and then after the letters went out everybody um, paid the parking fees um, and I think, how many times have we been out there, Troy? Three or four times, I think? I guess four. Four times. Um, it took us about, I would say, a sweep of the parking lots is about 45 minutes. Um, there's probably about an hour's worth of follow-up after that, just entering information in spreadsheets and that sort of thing. So, I mean, we've been able to do it efficiently in a way that doesn't take a lot of time. And um, Troy might... I'm trying to interpret his <laughs> dagger eyes or not. But I think in terms of administrative time, it's, we're not investing a lot. Um, if the desire is that the parking fees become a way to have a much more constant administrative presence out there, I don't want to create any illusions because I, I um, don't think that would be a good use of, of, of time uh, right now. Thank you. I guess that was my, that's I guess my question is that the reason I was doing parking fees was so that there was more um, walk through using the parking lot as part of a classroom environment and so there would be some more supervision where we don't have cameras there and there's uh, paraphernalia in the parking lot as trash. So that was my, one of the reasons um, I was including parking fees in. So that really is a different subject and a different line item. So I'll talk to you. We can talk about okay. that. I'll get your recommendations to help me think through that process okay. another time. Any other questions on the parking fee? Okay. Well, I think I, I've already made it clear before, but I don't support the parking fees. Not just because of the administration piece, but um, I don't, uh, when we did it last year, I felt that we were putting our budget adult issues on the backs of the students. Now, the parents may in fact be paying the parking fees, but I'm sure some of the students are paying them. Um, I know if my daughter was still in school, she'd be paying it herself. But um, I, I think we've talked a lot about our concerns over the fees that parents are paying. The fees for athletics, the booster, contributions, SEEF contributions, and I know there's been lots of discussions in the past about how many more fees do we want to give to the parents. Um, and so, for me, the parking fees potentially become a slippery slope that first we have parking fees and then we've added something else and something else. And it concerns me that we start running down a path where we're a public school um, and we're not giving the same opportunities to all our students because of varying fees. So that's why I don't support the parking fees. Obviously, as last year, um, I voted against them, but the board, um, you know, majority said yes. And if the majority says yes again, then that's fine. But um, those are my reasons for not supporting them. So thanks. Any other comments on the parking fees? I think last year was a different year. Um, uh, we were looking at um, a budget process where everyone was being asked to s sort of pitch in. Um, parking, there are those of us who believe, myself included, that um, driving to school and parking at school is a privilege. Uh, the taxpayers pay um, quite a bit of money, I think between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars a year to pave and plow and sand those lots. So a $50 fee um, a year did not seem excessive. Uh, we provide transportation uh, to school. It would be different, I think, if we didn't provide transportation. Um, but uh, I, I, I know it was controversial um, last year but I did hear from as many people who thought it was a brilliant idea, parents, and could, um, you know, it gave them the opportunity 
to pass on some responsibility to the child for the privilege of driving their car to school. Um, if we do take it out of the budget, uh, it's going to have to come from, we're going to have to find $8,000 somewhere else. So I don't know um, where we'd want to find that. I mean, I think it's, uh, I mean, for myself, because I'm not, at, I'm not in favor of at raising the budget from this maintenance budget. So. Anyone else? Do we want to do it? a vote on whether, is that the right thing to do, whether this, yeah, is it an area where we want to, we want to give it, we have to give direction, direction, um, are we ready to do that or do we more comments first? I have one more comment about parking fee. Um, I think if we didn't have the parking fee, Jeff, am I correct in thinking that the kids wouldn't be attached to their cars? So those who may drive fast, those who may um, be spotted on campus, um, moving quickly around the campus, would not be attached to a car. Um, not have, it, it, to me, it's a safety check. You mean be able to be identified? Yes. Is that, oh, is that? Yeah. You know, um, the car is attached to the child, so therefore, like a backpack. That's another piece I like about the parking fees, but I don't know if that's trackable. I'm, yeah, I'm not sure that the parking fees is add, honestly, anything to that. Um, it saves us a step in identifying the kids, but in the past, if we have a student who's a community member reports is speeding on, or we notice is speeding on, or being careless, or parents. Yes, <laughs> yes, um, yes. On campus, uh, we will we have before this year. We always called the police um, and just said, "Here's a license plate. Can you give us the information about who this vehicle is registered to?" Okay. So, and that's pretty easy to do. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah. I didn't succeed in biting my tongue enough because this went on too long, but I, I agree with Mary, um, and I understand Kathy's concerns. I've always been one who believes that public school system should be paid for by the public and not fees on children and parents. However, to me, maybe it's because I never owned a car growing up, that the mere fact that you can own a car, you can afford to own a car, and you, par and you we provide a parking spot which the maintenance of which we cover in our public budget I think it is appropriate to charge some money it's eight thousand is not going to make or break this budget one way or the other I thought it was simply a political and equitable solution for people to play it's not like sports it's not like band it's not like this it's not essential to drive your car um, but it's a privilege and if we have to pay for you to be able to park there by maintenance, then on a privilege in the fact that you can actually afford to own a car, um, I personally think you should pay something for it. Uh, I am concerned about the slippery slope that Kathy is. I don't think it starts at the parking fee. That's my view. Okay. <coughs> Let's, just uh, one yeah. quick thing too. I just agree with both your comments and, and having gone to school here, and seeing the difference in size of that parking lot when we were in school here, it's probably tripled um, inside, maybe four times as big as it used to be when we were here. And that, I, you know, that, that, that was a long time ago, like 25, 30 years ago. However, I just see those lots as, I know it's public property, but it's a piece of real estate too. I mean, and the fact that we've had to build a, uh, an intersection light to accommodate traffic and mainly kids with cars going back and forth and or parents dropping off. I just don't see it's a big, um, it, it's not much to ask for, it's not a huge chunk of money. Um, I, I think it's a privilege and we should continue you know, having these fees. Just okay. Um, so can I see a show of hands, I guess, of, people, of board members who would be interested in um, asking the superintendent to change his recommendation around parking fees. In other words, you would be raising your hand if you were opposing the fees. Okay. 
Okay. Um, one question I have, are we, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're opposing, I know there's a why we pick parking fees to have a vote on out of thousands of budget line items. Are we going to go through each line item and vote on or I thought we were just going to? No. I'm what just, we're well, doing I'm just concerned about. Just, <clears throat> no, what, what we're doing right now is we're going, we're circling back to various areas of the budget that were that were we addressed previously but we had some we had specific concerns about or or uncertainty about um, and this was this was one of one of those um, so we, we won't be visiting every line item or else you would have to bring your pajamas. No, I, I, I was curious <laughs> on the process. I mean, my concern was, you know, you know we, we get tentative agreement, and it doesn't mean, you know, other, is there someone that doesn't agree with the parking fees? It doesn't necessarily mean you agree with them. You may just say, I defer to, you know, the overall budget in the direction. So I just wanted to clarify yes. the process. Yes, I think that's a fair way to make that decision, absolutely. Um, so, I have in my notes other areas where board members uh, uh, address concerns, but I'm not going to list those. I'll just ask people to raise those concerns if they have them. David. I did have a concern about potential underfunding of some certain extracurricular activities. I did talk to Ken. I don't know if I talked to Jeff, but I don't think I did. But I became comfortable that that's not a major issue, so we can take that off the table. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other concerns? Okay. Um, I do have, and I've talked to Ken, and are comfortable with the work that, um, with the conversations with Ken with, around the reading recovery. Um, uh, the reading program we have and that the fee of reading recovery and the, the large number it is. But I know that the literacy team is doing work with Ken and um, they have a good handle on it and will um, do the best for the school. We talk about it in depth and um, so I'll give that to you but know that I'm, I am concerned about that very large number for the first grade program. Could I ask for some additional, obviously you had a conversation, but the rest of us weren't in on that. And I, and I, um, I've had concerns about the reading, the cost of the reading recovery program and the effectiveness of it for some years. Could you maybe um, expound upon what she's talking about? Yeah, um, Kate serves on the, uh, literacy task force and so she gets to see amongst other things the uh, tremendous work going on K through 5 with literacy. There are two consultants that we've hired to work with our K through 5 teachers that have really captured the, the enthusiasm and the energy of K through 5 teachers. So, you know, it's, it's the type of professional development work that we'd like to replicate five through eight, six through eight and in the high school um, because teachers are learning some things that they can apply and that's, that's the best kind of professional development. So reading recovery is just part of that discussion. Reading recovery is probably um, the Cadillac of interventions um, and if it's producing Cadillac-like results then we'll want to continue it. But it does jump off the page as a, as a new person, um, the amount of money <clears throat> that we're devoting to that program. So what I've begun to do is just meet with the individual reading recovery teachers to learn more about it. And also um, Tom and his staff are putting together the data. Because if the data shows that we're getting the kind of return on investment, then it would be crazy to mess around with it in my view. But on the other hand, if we're not getting the kind of return on investment, then we ought to look at perhaps using that methodology, but with a different type of um, 
teacher-kid ratio. Right now, it's one-on-one. -on -one. So in order for me to um, continue recommending that program, I'd have to be comfortable that we're getting that sort of result. Okay. And where are you in that process? Um, I've been here two and a half months, so. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't have it completely down. <laughs> what I don't want it to be is like, you know, you hired Murphy as an interim, and he's coming on an agenda to kill reading recovery. It's, it's not that. It's, it's just an approach that there's got to be data that supports anything. And if the data doesn't support it, then we take, you know, my opinion of reading recovery off the table and whoever is a big supporter of it. We just look at the data. Is this the best return on investment that we can make in order to? So I think within another month, six weeks, I'll have a, a better handle on whether we're getting the return on it than we are. We probably are. I can't imagine that it hasn't been looked at before, but I would just like to, to learn more about it. Thanks. Mary? Will this be something that the board will be updated on since it's such a large line item in the budget? Yeah. Um, and so you're tracking data. Are, are you, I'm assuming you're tracking data through grade 12 for kids who have had reading recovery one-on-one -on -one help? Is yeah, we'd like to look at all of that stuff. You know? yeah. Is that the plan, Tom? Yeah, it would just be an update, really, to, to make it more public. It's, okay. um, and it's slightly easier now because a lot of it's electronic. Okay, so that might be something we can add into a business meeting at some point, Ken? So I do, I do. I, I think, um, you know, even if we were to staff it differently, uh, you know, I, I don't think that's an area where I'd recommend any savings. I can think of some areas where we need additional literacy help. I mean, it's a middle school, and I haven't had a lot of time to discuss this with Steve, and I wouldn't want it imposed on them. But the other thing that sticks out as sort of a new person is, there's not a literacy lead teacher at the middle mm -hmm. school. Um, um, I think there should be. But again, that isn't something I'd want to impose on a staff. I would want you know, them to feel ownership of it. Uh, because it's the worst thing you can do is impose a position onto a school because it creates uh, uh, some, some problems you don't need. So. But that, that does. As much as you know, I look at what we're doing K-4, well, I'm looking at 5.8 and, and not seeing some resources there that I think we should have. Okay. Any other questions on reading recovery? Okay. Are there other issues that board members wanted to address around areas of the budget that we could circle back to. I just had a question. When, uh, at some point, we'll approve the budget prior to, uh, it sounds like, the completion of the negotiations with the teachers. Or just help me understand the timing. Um, so if we approve it, we feel good, you know, just so we understand, are we approving something that is contingent upon revision based on completion of that process? That's a good question, Michael. And we're going to meet on the 30th to put the uh, final touches on it. So the teachers will ratify first, and then it comes to the school board for ratification. So it should happen um, sometime in April. I'm not anticipating anything unusual happening. I mean, there's a tentative agreement, and I don't think that's going to become um, it's not going to unravel in our last meeting, is what I'm trying to say. Anything else? Okay. I, I wanted to circle back to energy. Um, really, at your recommendation, if that was something that you suggested we might take another look at. We're, we're Budget's based on locking in at three dollars a gallon mm -hmm. for that's the heating oil price. Yes. Okay. Um, but right now we would be that we wouldn't be able to do that. We're hoping that sometime between now and July first that we'll be able to lock in at that that rate or lower. 
Yes. Um, if we locked in right now, what what would the what would we be locking in at? Three thirty. Changes almost every day. Yeah, I, I, it's it is varied. Uh, last Friday was three forty five and three forty eight. Um, the prior was three nineteen. Uh, it's going up and down. I, I would not advise at all looking at locking in right now. Um, we should be waiting till June, July period, and I think you'll see it come down considerably at that point. Uh, it's pretty typical for it to drop a lot during the summer, summer months. So um, I've got a letter out that's gone out to about 11 uh, fuel oil dealers right now, and given them guidance of what we're looking to lock in at, um, which to be honest with you, I've asked 290. I'm not sure if I get it, but I'm going for it. Um, so kind of put the ball in motion, but I don't see locking in until June, July anyways. And it should be hopefully that three dollar range or less. Okay. okay. I think if we get a, a you know an indication we can lock in at around three dollars between now and then we probably bring that recommendation to you real quick and grab it. Okay. Because that's where we're budgeting that. And the safety we have there, remember, is we have not built in the projected savings from the new boiler, which is estimated at $47,000. And that was a conservative estimate. So you do have some room if you have to lock in at 32330, but that's when the bleaches story comes in, too, if you remember. <laughs> David? Um, Actually, he, I hate this, but he ended with the point I was going to question him. Then you don't have to ask it. Well, no. Uh, no, he, he, just, he just mentions the subject, which then makes me have to ask the question. Yeah. Um, first on the heating oil thing, uh, I, I don't know. I just think we have to think about this. I, I agree with Ken's suggestion. If we get anywhere near three, I'd almost, well, I'm not suggesting we do it, I'd almost like to get pre-approval. Four three. I mean, we, we have a war in Libya. We have all kinds of stuff going on. <clears throat> that is going to wildly fluctuate, probably hourly. So we get anywhere near three, and almost like to give them a chance to jump on it, and not wait for us to all get together in a meeting. It, it's, I don't know what. Nobody knows what it's going to. It historically goes down in the summer. Well, we may have degraded Libya to the point where they're fifteen percent in the oil market is causing all the skyrocket. I think this is a very dangerous situation. I'm glad to see we have a little bit of play in it, but I think on the oil issue, since it is a fairly major ticket item that we ought to consider, I don't know if we do it now, but I'd ask the chairman to consider, chairperson, excuse me, to consider uh, us approving anything within a certain range so that it's just way too wildly volatile to me. And the world events is what's, it's, I've read it often the times, the world events are, are, is what's driving it. Not logic, not monetary supply, not anything except for emotion. So, well, I'm not familiar with what, what, the, what board approval is required for actually locking in. We just do it. Yeah. There is but, no board approval required. You're at our mercy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think in fairness that, that it would be nice to have a sense of the board that, that if you get anywhere near three bucks, we're going to make an effort our budget's based on. Do it. We'll do it. Okay. <laughs> I'm mean, just looking at it another way. We can hope for $3, but if we approve it at 3 and it, it, it's at the same rate, what would the sources of funding be to offset? You're still going to, I assume we're still going to heat the school, so <laughs> you're going you're to pay whatever the price is. So, you know, budgeting and locking in are two different things. So. Do we, you know, say it stays at the current rate? What would, are there um, undesignated funds? I mean, just in terms of what funding would we use to, to pay for a higher than budgeted amount? And is that within the realm of experience? So it's not something we should worry about. Yeah, if it's higher, we have to lock in at three twenty, three thirty. Um, then we've got to live with the bleaches for another year. Um, so. Hopefully, we'll have both accomplished. And I, I have a letter that I'll pass out that you can read about the, the bleaches. And it basically says, you know, they don't meet code, you know, because they're 40 years old and the code has changed. And that um, there's some structural um, deficiencies, which Greg has pointed out. 
but that uh, you know no one's going to put a letter that they fail safe. But uh, but as as it stands right now, you've recommended replacing the bleachers. Essentially, if we can afford it inside of the existing budget, and that has a lot to do with our ability to lock in at three dollars. Yes. If we can lock in at three dollars, then you can do the bleachers this year. If it's going to be three thirty, then you've got a, about a fifty thousand uh, dollars gap in being able to fund the bleachers within this budget. So in that scenario, I would recommend doing the bleachers the next school year. Okay. Do we would we need to wait until summertime to do the bleachers, or could it be done at any time throughout the year? Yeah, it's got to get it rolling like the boiler, so that yeah, it comes I mean, to summer. If we're going to do it this summer, I have to start the process now. We can start the process now, as long as they know it's contingent upon funding. I mean, we can be ready to go, so that if we lock in, we, we, can, can, do. we can get the bleachers in. He doesn't need to wait until June. You know, to lock in and say, okay, now I've got to do the bleachers because it'll be too late. So he'll be getting the bleacher project ready to go pending funding because you can always pull the plug on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you agree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess the other thing I have to say is I'm, um, I'm all for asking us to go against your recommendation and just budget for the bleachers because. Um, yes, we're being very, you're doing your job um, very well, um, and thank you for doing that. But I guess I, um, if we, it will probably. I'm sure it'll work your way. It'll. I'm sure it'll work that we could do both this year. But it, I wouldn't want to wait until. It would make me uncomfortable to wait until next summer to do it. I have to say so. Um, is there other is there other support on the board for moving forward with the bleachers, even if we had to lock in at a higher rate and it meant increasing the budget? I have a question that regard <coughs> um, I just let, I'd like to know right now as the budget stands, how much do we have in it for the bleachers? So I understand it's this flood footprint three bucks and three thirty. It's about a fifty thousand dollar difference. How much in this budget is there for uh, repairing the bleachers next fiscal year? We've got the replacement of the bleachers in this budget, but it, um, this budget also is built on the $3 gallon. I understand that, but I'm just trying to balance the risk and benefits. $50,000. If, if the oil is three twenty, three thirty, dollars we're about $50,000 off. I got that part of the um, scales of justice, but I need the other part, which is how much do we have in the school budget now for bleachers? Excuse me, probably 80 if uh, I'm following your line of questioning right. correctly. Right. And, and it'll, in my recollection, it would take about 120, 130 to completely repair in the year. I mean, 30 for new bleachers. Okay. Ballpark. So I guess I've returned to my previous question. Is there is there support? Is there other support on the board for uh, repairing the bleachers this year, even in the event that we were unable to lock in at three dollars, and it meant adding money to the superintendent's budget? I'm not I'm not seeing right, <laughs> overwhelming great. enthusiasm yeah. for that. Support. Thank you for letting me um, bring it up. Okay. Or sit safe and comfortable. Of course. Uh, other questions? I mean, just look at me. The letter from our architectural and engineering, well, I'm not going to read the whole letter, but it says the bleaches and components are showing their age, but it does not imply a collapse is eminent. Right. Um, you can live with those bleaches another year if you have to. Thank you. I didn't read the letter. David. Um, I like the word imminent. I thought it was imminent, but that's okay. Um, I like to see somebody else make typos too. I, I just for the public, I, I want to explain in a simplistic way, which is the way I think, 
that we're really balancing things here. We have two slightly unknowns. We have money to do it if we can afford to do it. But if we have to use that money for oil, we have that money and we'll, we'll do it next year. If everything comes in well, we'll do it this year. But it's they're two fluctuating numbers that we'll never know the answer to, but we've got enough built in on either way so we can move by passing the budget. The superintendent has the ability to make the call for which we need to do and when we need to do it. And I, I think that's the best you can do with budget. Myself. It's not the only it's not the only number in the budget that's subject to change. Right. No, I would assume not even close. A lot of these are all estimates and that's what you put in a budget. Are there other questions about the bleachers or about energy? No. Are there other issues that members wanted to circle back to? We're getting to the end of my list. <laughs> you <can> surprise me. <laughs> We're going to wrap up a half an hour early. Oh, I can't allow that to happen. <laughs> I want to talk can about you give school. A speech, I, want to, I want to talk about school dress codes. <laughs> Kidding. All right. Well, I think I think then. Um, I, th I think what that would mean is that the board, uh, we, we meet again tomorrow night, we have a finance committee meeting, and then following the finance committee meeting, we will go back into bo uh, budget workshop. Um, and I think we have a tentative agreement around that, that uh, reflects the, the superintendent's recommended budget, um, and that we will, um, in that meeting, we will be able to vote are we voting on that in that meeting? I, I guess we vote. We vote in our business meeting, but we will. Right. We will. That's uh, what you usually do. We usually vote in the you business. Get meeting. a brief to the council on the sixth. So I don't think you have a, a yeah, meeting up in the big room until the fourteenth, right? So we'll have to call the business meeting. Okay, we'll have to do it tomorrow night. So we'll have, a, we'll have to have shop, not business. We can, we can. We'll, we'll, just add, we'll just add a business meeting. Yeah. Or, you, to be honest with you, I think what Kathy was about to say, as long as it's a public meeting and it's noticed, you can have the vote in any kind of meeting as long we'll, as We'll call it a business meeting, yeah. um, because we can do that, and that'll take care of all, anybody's concerns. And yeah. we, will, we will address the approval of the budget in that meeting. Yep. I would su suggest that you might want to, just for clarity, make sure that that notice gets posted that we have it. It will be posted. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask a question? We're yes. meeting tomorrow night at 6.30 for the Finance Committee, right? Correct. Right. And that's from 6.30 to 7.30? Yes. Okay. And then what were we going to do at 7.30? A budget workshop. A budget workshop. Okay. But we don't need one now. Or we may. We will, it will be exactly what we planned. The schedule hasn't changed, but mm -hmm. we're going to call it a business meeting so that we can vote on the budget. So there may be some discussion at 7.30? Yes, we'll have time for discussion before the vote. Okay. Uh, if you want to say anything about the budget, you'll have an opportunity to say that before the vote, and then we'll vote. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right, well, just, want, just to make sure we the three-year budget projection is a plan. It's not a budget we will be voting on. It's just directionally, it's a directional guidance on the spending drivers and what we know about revenue at this point. So that's not a budget. That's correct. Mary? Um, I just wanted to remind board members that the council is looking at changing the validation vote date. Um, okay, that's all right from May 10th to May 17th because um, we'll have to do a special election to replace uh, Senator Larry Bliss and our two surrounding towns are setting their budget validation for May 17th. So we will um, most likely change ours and then lobby the governor to hold a special election that day on the 17th. So both can be held in it. We'll save the town, I think, um, $6,500 to be able to do both of those in one election. So. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And the board is fine with that now. No issues around that. Okay. okay. Do we need a motion to adjourn? Mm -hmm. Can I have a motion? 
So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? <coughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.